This is John Abrams, and this is the Variety Artist, episode 71. Exciting news! There's a terrific article in the newest Vanish magazine all about the Variety Artist podcast. And me! I put it at the bottom of my About the Show page on my website at www.thevarietyartist.com. Do we really need the www anymore? Oh well. It tells all about why I'm doing this and how I got started. It's pretty cool. Special thanks to Paul Romani and Hal Myers, a.k.a. Damien, for the great article. While you're there, you can check out the other interviews and John Abrams goodies. Oh, and there's a fun video with all my critters. You can look at that, too. Next, I'm creating all sorts of variety artist swag, so keep an eye out for some great swag coming soon. Okay, today's interview. Clyde does something very different than you and I but his ideas and methods fit exactly what you do. As you listen to this one, picture how you can use what he says in your art. Have fun. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He's the founder of the Riddles Brood Touring Theater Company and a master storyteller. His company offers murder mysteries, game shows, customized shows, traveling dinner theater, and much, much more. Truly a touring company for all occasions. Variety artists, I give you Clyde Riddles Brood. Hello, John. Thank you so much for having me on today. What's going on, Clyde? Oh, it's been a great day. I actually already booked a couple shows this morning, so my sales strategies are working, and that's always a great way to start the day. That is a good way to start the morning. Now, now let me ask you something about the Riddles Brood name. Where did that come from? That's a great question. Uh, you know, a lot of people ask me that. Honestly, it's, it's a little bit unusual. To make a long story short, when I was living with my mother years ago, when I first started the company, uh, I was forced to live in the attic because that was the only room she had. And I didn't have any other place to live. The attic was haunted. Oh, there was a ghost in there. I would have nightmares in there, and sometimes I would have all kinds of uh, unusual experiences. Me and a couple of my friends at the time that were with me when we started were um, convinced that it was actually this character of Riddle's Brood that used to be in many of our Dungeons and Dragons adventures when we were kids. Wait, I have to hear about at least one unusual event that happened. One one time in particular, which was rather scary, was uh, it started to rain and there was a window open. The house is the house that my mother has, and she still has it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I woke up from this nightmare, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And I heard the rain, and I looked, and at the foot of my bed was a squirrel standing on the on on the footboard, just staring <laughs> at me. <laughs> so, so so I like grabbed like something off my end table and threw it at it. <laughs> and it ran and, and booked out the at the thing. Um, it was almost like the, the thing was like watching me dream, you know, like, oh, yeah. what the heck is that thing? But anyway, yeah, there was a, a, quite a few spooky, unusual circumstances that would occur uh, up in that attic. And uh, that is actually where, because I was planning the theater company when I was up there and coming up with a lot of the sales materials and all that. So we said, this is Riddles Brood's Theater. <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah. This is his theater company. So all this is for the greater glory of him. So was Riddle's Brood, was he the ghost up there? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, no one knows for sure, you see. <laughs> so, but that is this what, what is suspected, highly suspected. Now he follows us occasionally to where we perform. So if we ever decide to hire you to do a show in our attic, we better watch out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll always be careful not to look behind you and when you're in the audience because he might be standing behind you, looking at you, whispering <laughs> in your ear. So tell me about the Riddles Brew Touring Theater Company. What exactly is it? Well, we're a touring theater company in every sense of the word. We, tra- we travel around. We don't have a brick and mortar. Instead, we go to bank facilities, restaurants. We do go to other theaters, colleges, uh, libraries, pretty much anywhere where you can imagine doing a show. We set up. We do our show usually while the audience is eating. The uh, shows are about usually an hour, 15, hour and a half long. We break down and we leave. So it's kind of like a, like a DJ, you know, like a wedding band. You know, we come in, do our thing and, and, and get right back out. Or like a magician or juggler. Exactly. It's just like magic. Yep. Except yep. we don't use a smoke bomb right when we arrive and come out of the mist. 
<laughs> like ta-da! Sometimes we do that, but not often. <laughs> now you offered so many shows. Did you start with one show, or how did that work? I know you offer you do like murder mysteries and you do theater shows, corporate events, and all with different themes. Uh, how did you start that out? Well, when we first started, it was it was mostly improv comedy shows, which were done in a dinner theater environment. So they were done at restaurants, but they weren't murder mysteries when we first started, mostly. That wasn't as popular in 2000, 2001. But then over the years, we started doing more murder mysteries. Now we actually do about 80% murder mystery, mm. 20% uh, other show. But the reality is, is there's not a whole lot of difference. The only difference is it's a comedy show where somebody gets murdered in the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you've got to figure out who did it. So uh, other than that gimmick, uh, it's really not too different. But we have many different themes. And you know, we got like Sherlock Holmes. We got pirates. We got medieval. We got 1920s, all kinds of different themes, depending on what works for your group. So did you start writing all the individual themes or did you wait for a group to say, hey, I want pirates for my particular theme? Well, in the very beginning, when we first started, uh, our first show was actually a Scrooge, a comedy, and it was actually a comical version of A Christmas Carol. Mm. That was our very first show. And that was, you know, we, we kind of stole the basic, you know, story of Scrooge and then just kind of played with it and me messed with it. The next couple shows we did were actually shows that we had done previously at another theater down in uh, Cape May, New Jersey. But as time went on, we began to realize that doing these book shows, you know, were more traditional sense where you sit down, you rehearse for three weeks, four weeks, uh, and then do, uh, do the show for a long time. That model was not really conducive to the modern day traveling theater kind of circuit. So mm -hmm. a lot of people wanted to buy just one show. It was very hard to try to pigeonhole everyone to book the same show in the, in the two month period or something. Right. Uh, so we, we went to another platform. It's highly improvisational what we do now. It's basically based on a loose framework Highly improvisational, so all the actors are uh, really good at doing, uh, you know, ad libs and coming up with content, and a lot of jokes and a lot of funny material, a lot of crazy characters, very vaudevillian. And then what we do is we overlay the theme. Mm. Technically speaking, once the actors understand a lot of our bits and skits that we do, yeah. they can do many of the different themes. Mm -hmm. Now it requires a very short time to rehearse for one show, uh, and we offer. I would say maybe like 10 different shows at any given time now. Someone who's doing a particular type of theme, they say, hey, Clyde, we're doing this particular theme. You can just kind of plug it into what you've already written. Effectively, yes. I mean, right now, if you look on our website, it has all the shows that we have offered. So you can pick any of those themes right there. Uh, and of course, we, do, we can do customization. And actually, we really enjoy doing that. So uh, I think it was just a couple of days ago, we had somebody uh, hire us and they, they said they wanted to, their son just graduated legal school. Mm -hmm. They're going before the bar. So they wanted us to create this whole show about their son uh, becoming a lawyer. And so we did that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we made it so that uh, he was going to be arrested, had to defend himself from embezzling his parents' money, <laughs> you know, to put him through school. Uh, so it was very funny, but we, we, we created all that based on just asking them a bunch of questions and finding out information about their family that everybody could relate to uh, mm -hmm. so we could, you know, get everybody in the audience and get a nice connection. Now, do you have something written out when you interview them and want their theme or is it just a general conversation? Usually it's a general conversation. We can just make the customizations very, very general. Like for instance, in a murder mystery, usually we also have something gets stolen, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a gem or, you know, a safe of money or whatever it might be. But we can also sometimes, you know, just make the item that's stolen something significant to the group. Like if it's a college or say a fraternity, we can have somebody steal their mascot, you yeah. know, or something like that. So those simple things we can just do, you know, just because of the, our ability and skill. If okay. it's really intense, like we did have one time where we were, did a show from Comcast and they actually gave us some of their uniforms and we made a whole show about them going to a haunted house, having to install cable in a haunted house. Oh, that's great. So that was much more elaborate. Uh, yeah. So we actually had to rehearse that and create a lot of custom content. So there was extra costs associated with that. But mostly, it's, it's pretty easy for us to do. Now, how much leeway do you give your actors? Uh, I know you have your framework, but have you ever had an actor do something where you go, oh, boy, that's a little bit over the line? Yes, but, you know, we have some basic rules for that. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things about us is we, we, we don't like censorship. So we 
not are always not always very politically correct. As a matter of fact, one of the things we say is the only censor is the client. Mm. So that means sometimes we'll do a show for, you know, a bunch of Republicans or something like that. And we'll be making fun of Hillary, making fun of Obama and all that stuff and be brutal. Yeah. But then we could do another show where we're at some kind of like nonprofit where they're all liberal and we could be making fun of Trump and all that stuff. So we kind of like go either way. Now, the one thing we don't do is we don't do any cursing mm-hmm. or overt vulgarity. So no crotch grabbing, none of, no really filthy yeah. kind of stuff like that. That being said, we get very close to the line sometimes. You know, there could be some Viagra jokes or something like that yeah. or double entendre. But usually we don't do anything that's cursing or really, really, really vulgar. And are those rules, do you have like written down rules or is that kind of, uh, you talk to your actors as you hire them and as you talk to them, as you work with them? Well, both. I mean, uh, there are certain ones that are literally codified, which are, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, no cursing. If you you can't do any cursing, Uh, there has been some shows where, where that's happened, but usually it's when the audience is so far nuts that basically they give us permission, you know? Yeah. So, so if we're in the audience, like we, we did a ladies night, uh, I mean, it was last summer and these ladies were, boy, they were drinking and they were ready to have a lot of fun. And, but they were throwing <laughs> out some, some, some crazy stuff. And at that point we're just like, okay, well, you know, they're throwing the F bomb around every other word. We might yeah. as well too. <laughs> but, but it, it, that's highly, highly rare. Yeah. But they've, they've given you license. Right? Yes, exactly. But, you know, it's hard for them to, you know, uh, get mad at us for breaking that rule if they're literally, yeah. you know, take your shirt off. And if they're doing that kind of stuff, I mean, it's like, okay, what are you going to do? Yeah. But that's really, really rare. Really, really rare. But I'm sure it does happen. Have you thought about adding any, any variety arts to your, uh, to your show? When you say variety arts, can you clarify that a little more? Oh, sure. Like, like, like magic or juggling, or I know I, I saw some of them in some of your shows. There's a number of singers, uh, which I consider a variety art. But I'm thinking more like uh, balloons, uh, juggling, all that type of thing. Well, you know, I'll be honest. A lot of it depends upon the talent that we have on deck at the at the time. But uh, we do do some products every year that have uh, some of that. Like, for instance, we have one character that plays ukulele. He goes table to table and plays music. His name is Woody. He's a great guy. He's literally been with us since 2001. Oh. He also does still walking. We don't do that as much as a middleman because there's not a lot of profit in being in the middle of that. Yeah. Uh, but he does some of that for our shows. Uh, we have a couple of things that we do. Like every year we do something called Brunch with Santa or Santa's oh, yeah. Magic Toy Shop. And that has a Santa character. Uh, it has elves that do balloon animals. So several of us know how to do balloon animals pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a couple that are really good and a couple that are okay. We wouldn't call themselves professionals, but we certainly do a good job for, you know, 30 kids. In sure. Room. And also we do other things like that. Like sometimes we've done some table table games where we, um, you know, for instance, like bring a little game to a, each individual table. We're telling jokes and they, the audience can, can like put their hand in any one of three holes and maybe something will happen or, uh, you know, so, so there's <laughs> stuff like that. I won't even say what I'm thinking. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, how do you travel with a, I was reading you do dinner theater. Uh, do you actually supply food or how, how do you work that out? We don't do the food. Uh, you know, usually they'll have a caterer or a restaurant uh, that we that we perform in doing it. So I would say most of the time we're at a restaurant or a bank facility and they cater it and we just do the entertainment. That's a good money maker for both of you because then the restaurant makes the money for the food and then you make the money for the performance, right? Exactly. Well, now let's switch gears a little bit about and talk about storytelling. Mm. Whatever variety art you're doing, adding storytelling to your art it makes a world of difference. So tell us about storytelling. How do you come about creating a story for your shows? I, I know you've, you've already, you already have a framework that you work with that you've had for years and years and years. Do you have new ones that you come up with? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In the context of a show, uh, it's important to understand the audience, our job, we, we look at our main job when we walk into a room is to ch- – is to crawl into the minds of the audience and change their emotional state from indifferent or bored or, you know, God forbid, irritated, uh, and change them to being more effervescent, happy, you know, excited, engaged. 
our story is always the idea that the audience is sad and needs to be turned around. So mm -hmm. we're trying to inspire them with every single show that we do. The story of most of the murder mysteries is, is very formulaic. Somebody dies, an inspector comes in of some sort, and a bunch of weird, crazy suspects come out, and the audience has to figure out which one of these people did it. it. Um, so the story is very, very uh, archetypical. Um, the, the thing that really kind of engages the audience with the story perspective is we're constantly engaging the audience, and we're inviting them to kind of join in the fun with the actors. So the actors are often cracking each other up, trying to screw each other up with jokes. So it's, 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 it's almost like the audience is also watching these people play around with each other, which mm -hmm. is an aspect of it. I don't know if I would say storytelling is a massive aspect of the shows themselves. Where our power of storytelling comes into play the most is in terms of sales mm -hmm. and in terms of differentiating ourselves from our competition. That's yeah. where our storytelling really shines. And what do, you, what do you mean by that in sales and things? If you are selling entertainment, yes. and I'm sure any of your magicians or jugglers or anybody, they understand that when, when a client calls them up and they're thinking about buying, it's an intangible thing. They, they can't hold it in their hand. They can't look at it. They can't you know, evaluate its value. They have to trust you. They have to believe that if they hire you, you're going to come in there and you're going to knock the audience out of the park and you're going to really make them happy. Yep. Because of that, trust and building trust and building rapport with a, a client is so important in entertainment. Mm. So if you have your choice of choosing one of three different murder mystery companies, what I try to do is when I speak to them, I try to get really engaged. I ask them a lot of questions. I do a lot of listening. I try to understand really what their goals are. And that way, what I can do is then I tell a story about the future event. I say, well, here's an example of how your night is likely to go. Mm -hmm. And then I'll start with us arriving and I'll go through the whole evening from when the audience arrives, when they hear the music and they see the LED shining on the wall and already they got the mood of, hey, something cool is going to happen in here tonight. Then they get the food and, you know, they all of a sudden the actors are coming out going table to table. Then all of a sudden the lights come on. I kind of really paint a very colorful, vivid picture of what the evening is going to be like. Uh, and how the audience is going to react to it all with wow, wonder, mystification, and enthusiasm. That storytelling through that sales process, I would say, is a major component of how we uh, get people to really buy into what we're selling. Yeah. Now, have you found that over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years that more and more people are going through email? So you've had to sell them on email or do you try to get the conversation going over the phone? Well, because of the nature of what we sell, it's, it's, it's customized enough and high ticket enough. People usually want to speak to you on the phone. Okay. We certainly book shows where people just email us and it's a company party and the person isn't that invested and it's not their money or whatever. And we just do everything via email and it's very professional, very businesslike, and that's fine. But I would say much more of the time, the complexity is such where I would, we, I would call them up or they would call me and we would have a, you know, 30 minute conversation over the phone to go over the events because they might not have a really good idea how it works. Right. You know, so, so they usually really need that hand holding. And I think it really is good to set the expectation properly over the phone. It does a couple of things. It differentiate, differentiates you from the other guys because chances are the other guys are saying, oh, yeah, it's a murder mystery. Somebody gets killed. Comedy ensues and everybody leaves happy. And that's it. Yeah. There's people that are willing to just go slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, and, and do that. But, uh, you know, that's where the differentiation comes from. We try to be very customer service friendly, very sales heavy. You know, I try to touch each client myself. So I, I try to make sure that, you know, we're on top of all the events and it's not robot, robotic or, yeah. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem you know, overly stale. Sure. And it also gives them a chance to talk to you and find out, Hey, you're a nice, friendly guy, as opposed yeah. to, uh, you're just getting down to business and that's the way it is. And this is how much it costs. And there it is. Yeah, exactly. And, and you, you have to be a good listener to understand, you know, what the 
idea is behind this client. I mean, if they're calling up, if they, maybe they're in a hurry, maybe they don't care, maybe they just want to get the thing booked on the calendar, be done with it. Well, uh, we're responsive to that. So if they're if they just want to get down to the facts, boom, 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 we'll do that, and and I'll stop talking. But if they seem to need a little bit more information or really want to talk about it, really want to have a better idea, then I'll do that too. Now let's switch gears again. Uh, I noticed that you sell in packages and a lot of us sell in packages too. Uh, why are packages important? We started doing packages all the way back in 2006. The reason for that is really psychological. You know, a lot of research, and I'm sure people could get some books on this, it has indicated that you don't want to give people too many choices because it just paralyzes their decision-making ability. Yeah. But you don't want to just make people fit in one choice either. So if you have three choices, several things can happen. One, uh, they know that you have the quality and the experience to do something maybe even bigger than they need. Mm -hmm. So there's an implicit idea there. Well, if I only have 30 people and they can do a show for 500 people, this is going to be easy to them, yeah. right? Uh, so there's some concepts there that you're kind of uh, implying. The yeah. other reason is, is you give people a place to fall in line. So we have like our top of the line, all the bells and whistles package where we bring a full set, architectural lighting, we light up the room, big sound system, wireless microphones, everything. Then we have the next step down which is not quite as big, but it still has lighting. It still has wireless microphones and we use a rear projection system and a curtain backdrop. So it's still very visually attractive, still very looks great in the room. And then we have our smaller package, which is basically in the round, which is actually what most murder mysteries are like. And that's just the actors walking around in between the tables doing the show without benefit of any production value. Mm. So that's actually where most theaters we're, we're not most theaters, most murder mystery companies are. So we're differentiated from most other murder mystery companies by the fact that we have a much more production value kind of weight on our shows. We, we try to wow people with spectacle as much as we try to just have fun with interactivity. I know we're not talking about this, but I have to, I watch one of your videos and one of the funniest things I've seen in a long time is I don't know who it was. One of your actors or you, I don't know who it was brought in, uh, uh, I don't know, six or eight dogs on a leash. <laughs> That's called the keeper of the hounds. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of the funniest things. I'm sure anybody listening to this remembers or knows of like one invisible dog on a wire. And it kind of reminded <laughs> yeah. me of that. But there's like, I don't know, what is there? Six, seven dogs on the end of these wires. And when you shake them, they all look like they're barking and running and moving and all crazy. Yeah, that, that, that's actually from our Sherlock Holmes show. Uh, that's one of the characters, one of the suspects. It's called the Keeper of the Hounds. <laughs> and honestly, that's a very indicative thing of what we try to do in our shows. Like one of the things we try to do is we rely, well, I wouldn't say rely, but we feature gimmickry in costumes and props. So rather than just have a character walk out wearing contemporary clothes, you know, which is boring because everybody yeah. sees it every day, our characters are going to walk out with a huge hat, you know, a big you know, parrot on their shoulder that's audio animatronic and barks and, and stuff and talks to people. It's going to be wild and crazy visually. <laughs> and the reason for that is when the character first comes out, even before they say a word, they win the audience right away. So the audience right away says, oh my God, look at this crazy guy. Something crazy is going to happen here. Right. Uh, so it's, it's, it's colorful. It's exciting. It's, it's, it's out of the box. It's unusual, novel. So we really want to hit him over the head with that kind of stuff. And that's different than a lot of, I'll tell you what, a lot of other murder mystery companies, and we do go see them. They don't, they don't do that. You know, it's like they show it's, up in a suit. It's like, okay, whoop de doo I've seen a suit before. Yeah, it's true. I, I worked for a lot of murder mystery companies 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and you would show up in your regular clothes. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of underwhelming. Uh, you know, not, that's not my cup of tea. I mean, I'm, listen, I'm sure if you're really funny and really good, you'll make it. But I think the visual uh, stuff really, the visual gags make a huge difference. Yeah, it's just a different style. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, back to packages. What do you think is your most popular package? Statistically speaking, I'd probably say the middle one, the standard package, which is 1300 bucks, is probably the one that we do the most, which makes sense, right? It's in the middle. Yep. 
But it also depends upon the audience size. Generally speaking, the smaller the audience, the smaller the package, because that's all you really need. Yeah. Unless you're really trying to wow the audience with prestige. I mean, there's sometimes we do some high end corporate events, you know, at a casino or for a pharma company or something like that, where they might only have 50 people, but they're their clients or whatever, and they want to make it look great. So they, they'll book our deluxe package, you know, for like $2,600 for a small crowd. But they're doing that because the money's not what they're concerned about. They want to wow their guests. Sure. Um, so if prestige and impression and making a big, big impression is important, then the higher packages are going to have that equipment that are going to allow you to leverage that. Yeah. But technically speaking, you really don't need all that for a small group because, you know, our actors are loud. You don't need mics for 30 people. You know, you don't need lights for a small room. You might not even have room to set that stuff up. Now, now tell me about you're saying the laugh justifies the means. Now, <laughs> well, if the audience seems like they're really attracted to a certain kind of humor, we're going to go there. So it's like, you know, whatever it takes to get the laugh, we do. Because the ultimate, the ultimate goal is to change their minds from the – indifferent switch or not that interested switch to on, mm -hmm. you know, we want to get them really into it, into the game. And in order to do that, you got to reach them where they live. Uh, so whatever it takes to get the laugh, we do, you know, within reason. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's, that's the basic motto is it, our job is to get laughs. Our job is not to impress ourselves with our great acting ability. Our ability, our job is to make them happy. Oh, yeah. And that's actually a big differentiation because there are some actors that come from the community theater world or, you know, the higher artistic theater kind of mindset. They come with the idea that our job is to enlighten the audience with our great ideas and lecture them about morality and, and, and worldly issues. That's not what we do at all. Our job is just entertainment. Uh, ah. And some people have a hard time with that. Yeah, but if, if they're working with you, that's what, the, that's what they're going to do. Right, and that's why a lot of our actors tend to be, we don't even call ourselves actors as much as entertainers mm. because really that's what it is. It's more comedians is, is really a better way to go. I mean, obviously we're actors, but the comedic instinct is far stronger in our group than maybe in some others. Yeah, so when you're looking for somebody new, you're looking for somebody with strong improv and comedy skills. Yes uh, and no, I'll be honest. You know, a lot of the people that have turned out to be the best are people that aren't even actors. I mean, like waiters or people that are anybody, if, they're re if they just have that natural spark and they love to get the laugh and they like people and they like goofing around, the, you know, I've seen a lot or sometimes like really well-trained actors don't work really well. They, wow. they don't know how to do it. Whereas you know, that's not always the case. I mean, there are actors that have done improv and, and comedic theater and then they, they do a great job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'll be honest, some of the best people that we've had have come from outside the acting world. That's interesting. Huh? All right. Well, we're going to move to factor something John just made up the variety artist's favorite games. That sound like fun. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's, let's go for it. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a headline and you're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. All right. All right. I'll, I'll do my improv skills here. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> is it okay for me to lie? Oh, yeah. It, if a lie is funny, can I lie? Or As long as it's funny. Oh, okay. Is it fat? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. <laughs> All right, here we go. First headline. Clyde once did an end of the world show and the town he did it in was wiped out a few days later in a hurricane. That's actually true. <laughs> we I don't know if that, is that I don't know if that's funny or not. Uh, well, it, it's funny. It's ironic too because I, what it was is actually it's kind of funny, and I I don't always like to be self-deprecating with our product <laughs> online, but I have to tell you, in 2012, we came. We thought it would be really funny and timely to come out with a post-apocalyptic end of the world show that has like a Mad Max character in it, you know that kind of thing. 
And we pitched that. It was called Apocalypse, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and to make a long story short, it didn't really work that great. People didn't respond well uh, to it. And we tried. We kept rewriting it. We kept changing the skits, and it didn't really work. Well, we did a show up in New York. I think it was like by Jamaica Bay, or it was it was on the Long Island uh, beaches area. I can't remember where it was, but we did the show there. It was like the last week or two of October, the set fell down oh. and like landed on a table and nobody really got hurt. But at this, like, before the show even started, the set fell down, smashing the table. Everybody's drinks everywhere. Everybody's screaming. Ah! Oh, no. So right away, the client's all over us, right? Of course. Yeah, you guys are, well, you guys are idiots. So we set it back up. We're all like, Oh my God. Oh my God. And then, the guy ordered us with the microphones. Well, it just so happens this, the goofy person who packed forgot to pack the microphones. Oh. So we had even more egg on our face. I mean, I'm like back there, you know, saying, I'm so sorry. We're going to, we'll take a couple, 200 bucks off. You know, you know, we're trying to like prevent this from going sour, but the guy's getting angry. Well, then on top of that, uh, the, some of the people in the audience started smoking. And it set the fire alarm off. Oh, great. So then everybody had to exit the building, and the fire department had to come. And it was like 30 minutes later, they turned it off. So by now, nobody in their right mind is even thinking about wanting to see a show about the end of the world. Of course. So <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, anyway, so we, we start doing the show. And unfortunately, as you can imagine, we didn't have the mics. It was a larger audience, like 60 people, 70 people. And once they people couldn't hear us, everybody just started talking amongst themselves. Oh, yeah. So basically, we were doing the show going through the motions, and everybody in the audience is just talking and talking and talking and just totally yeah. ignoring the show. Uh, uh, so we lost them. Way, it was a failure in every sketch of the word. So we do the show. The guy says, he hates you, hates you. So we had to like give him a super deal on the pay. Mm. Drive away. And then, like, uh, pretty much, like, the day or the next day, a hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, came in to hit the New Jersey coast of New York and literally blew the town down. <laughs> the, the building that we did, gone. All the little buildings around it, gone. Burned and fell into the water. The oh town, is, that whole area is still never come back. Wow. So, so we, were, we were saying, it's a curse. It's the curse of this show. Dang. If you ever do the show, people have bad things. And actually, it actually doesn't even end there. We did it in another place. And the, the other place, the power went out right after the show, and they couldn't get the power on for like a week. So it was pretty much like everywhere we did this show, death. <laughs> you're thinking, death you're thinking this and show horror is comes to follow. That, that should be on your website, a big giant warning banner on the top. Do not hire us for yeah. this show. Yeah, I mean, we'll do it for you, but we cannot be held responsible for the consequences that may occur. Yeah. You know, That's great. We, all, we only sell it to those people we really don't like that much. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next one. Two actors didn't show up at a particular gig, so Clyde had to play three different parts. Yes, that's uh, that's kind of right. Although it wasn't, uh, I wasn't actually in that show technically. But what happened was, oh wait, I, I made that up. That's actually true. Well, no, that is true. Uh, there there was one show. This was a long time ago. We were doing a show. I, I can't remember the name of the bar, but it's like on two hundred six in New Jersey. And uh, what happened was, we got there. It was a Halloween show, and most of our shows are about four actors. Well, mm -hmm. one actor just just didn't show up. The guy who was in charge uh, was like, oh, okay, well, hopefully they'll, you know, he called in and said, I can't make it. So now they're down to three, which is still doable. We can still do the show with three people. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, another actor calls in and says, oh, man, I can't find the, I can't find the venue, man. I, where is it? And mm -hmm. we're like, well, it's, you know, it's here, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, oh, okay. So it calls back 10 minutes later. We're like, where the heck are you? 
He's like, yeah, I'm kind of stuck. Can somebody send me? Can somebody come and get me? Oh. I'm like, what do you mean you're stuck? <laughs> well, come to find out what the goofy guy did is he drove his car. He didn't have a, a GPS uh, and he drove his car based on a map through the Pine Barrens and went, tried to drive on like dirt roads. Oh. So he's like driving on dirt roads in the middle of the Pine Barrens. Finally, he gets stuck in this sand pit. His, his car gets stuck in the sand pit. Oh, no. The other guy, I send, the other actor gets sent out to try to find him. He, he comes back and says, I can't go in there. My car will get stuck. I can't go find him in there. Yeah. So anyway, the actor eventually walks his way out, hitchhikes to the gig. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he hitchhikes to the gig. By the time he makes it, it's at the end of the show's done. <laughs> now, now, what happened was, so it was basically just the two people doing the show. <laughs> However, this is what happened. The client that hired us forgot they booked the show. Oh. They forgot they booked the show. And they had an outside catering gig for Halloween. It was a Halloween show. So the owner and all their main waiters and everybody were at an outside catering event. So when we got there, we're setting up. We don't know anything. And the people that are there don't know anything either. We didn't hear anything wrong. <laughs> um, so we're getting ready for the show. Well, then, like, one table comes in, sits down. Oh, no. Uh, they, they, they really didn't advertise it. They had it on their website, but they didn't do any advertising. She forgot about it. Mm. So one table came in. Since there was only one table, the two actors just w were able to just do a whole comic routine. You know, he's, it took up a, a whole hour. And they loved it. They loved it. <laughs> and then finally, the owner and all comes back in and says, what are you guys doing here? And then she goes, oh, my God. I'm so sorry. I forgot. Oh, you know, uh, don't worry about it. We'll make it, you know, we'll help you guys out here. We're going to get anything you guys want to eat. You can order off the menu. Oh, nice. So, there, so she's apologizing to us, and we were the ones that were all messed up. When we started to sit down to eat, the other actor hitchhiked, and he finally got there and said, oh, uh, sorry, I'm late. You know, when's the show start? He goes, the show's over, man. You missed it. <laughs> and he goes, oh, well, can I order something to eat? Oh, <laughs> we're like, sure, dude. That was yeah. his last show, by the way. All right, we're going to go on to the next one. Uh, Clyde was once running late to a gig, wound up in a cul-de-sac, and drove over lawns to get to the venue. Yes, that is true. I was. I have to admit, that was me this time, and... Uh... I was with uh, one of our favorite actors. His name is Brian. And, uh, you know, we're driving the van and uh, we're, we're late. Got the, the map. And this is kind of like before GPSs. So, you know, this is before we had that. And we're driving around and we're, we're going late. Finally, the map shows us how to get there. So we, we go in and we pull in. It's a cul-de-sac. So the map was wrong. It used to be a street. Now it's a cul-de-sac. Ah. So we pull in. We're like, what the heck? But we look, and between the houses, and between like a little kid's play set and a little kiddie pool and, and some trees and uh, some stuff, way out there is a street. And on the other side of the street is the bar we need to get to. <laughs> <laughs> so I put it in first gear. We go up the curb. We start really slowly going across the front lawn. <laughs> We start going into the back backyard. I go around the, the swing set. No, luckily, wait, so nobody's back wait, there. So wait, wait, so you're driving through somebody's backyard? Driving through somebody's lawn. Luckily, they didn't have a fence. They didn't have a barking dog, but the dog didn't do nothing. <laughs> then we start driving through the trees, you know, in between trees, in between, over a couple of bushes. And then we pulled out <laughs> on the other side of this road, pulled up, pulled up into the, pulled up into the, um, the the park a lot of the restaurant started unloading like nothing happened nothing happened right yeah so uh you know occasionally these types of things must happen the show must go on that's right you got to realize that john yes i do all right next one this will be the last one how clyde, many of these do you got Jeez. this is it this is the last one <laughs> clyde did a show at a nudist colony Uh, yeah, that, I, technically it wasn't me at this one, but the legend is so big that, uh, yes, that is true. We've, we've done a show at a nudist colony. Oh, the legend is big. The legend is big. Yes. Because, uh, the actors, uh, I have to admit this, the actors were told that 
it was a, you know, a nudist colony, but I don't think they really absorbed it or understood what that really meant. Because when they showed up, uh, everybody started showing up nude, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so they're, they're doing the show. Uh, they started doing the show and the people walk up to them and go, listen, you guys can do anything you want. I know, you know, you don't do this. I said, you guys can say anything dirty. You can say anything. Vul- you could do anything you want. These guys love the party, right? Yeah. They're getting ready for the show and they're like, oh man, this is going to be really weird. So they start getting ready to do the show and all of a sudden wait 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 just so i just just so i can picture this is this outdoors it is no no indoors indoors it's in it's in a banquet room okay it's down the shore down uh i forget what it's called but it's up in uh uh, central new jersey by the beach the the town escapes me but this is what happened a cop shows up right yeah and stop everything stop everything so what happened was apparently somebody called in and complained. Uh, one of the one of the people uh, from the the bar or the restaurant. Huh. The the show might not have gone on. So what happened was is they said, well, if you guys want to do the show, it's it's against health regulations for you to be sitting nude in here. So mm. what they had to do is they had to get towels. So they had somebody run out to a store, buy a bunch of towels, and put them on all the seats, and everybody could sit nude if they sat on the towel. Okay. So. <laughs> so finally we got the show ready everybody had their towel everybody had their butt sitting on a towel hopefully it wasn't a white towel i don't remember maybe a brown one would have been better but they got the towel <laughs> ready to go uh, it's funny you brought up the keeper of the hounds the one character comes out yeah with the keeper of the hounds which is has a skill has a kill he's a scotsman right uh-huh. so they're all like what's under the kill what's under the kill well a bunch of the ladies got up and just literally grabbed him, captured, captured, started fondling him, grabbing, trying to pull his skirt off, trying to pull his clothes off. Finally, all the actors were like, oh, my God. And a lot of the people just started coming out of the audience and started trying to take everybody's clothes off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, this was an all-male cast. Otherwise, this could have gone in a different direction. <laughs> Our guys were, like, pretty much okay with it. Now, they didn't get nude, but they were, like, just still doing it. They were going with it. And as a matter of fact, and then at the end, they got all free drinks. So they all came back and they were just like, oh my God, this was the best show ever. Oh, it's just crazy. It was, it was one of those crazy shows that occasionally you you get that you can tell a story about, but um, yeah, the nudies. How fun. Occasionally I'll interview somebody. Um, Usually magicians get hired by nudist colonies. (laughs) <laughs> and they have the option of doing it nude or clothed and magicians need, you know, we need pockets. We need this and that the other thing. And it's very difficult doing a magic show in the nude. Right. I right. would think I've never done it, but yeah. Where do you hide stuff? Right. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. That was back Ooh. or something. John just made up. Ah. Now tell me you told that story on other podcasts. Uh, I don't know the nudie story. I think that uh, that's just a. Le- I think you're the first with that legend. I don't know. I feel very good about that. I, I don't know about that one. Every once in a while, usually we'll just tell one story, and I don't think any of these stories are the ones that I usually tell either. Oh, good. <laughs> I think you got some new ones there. Good, good, good. But hopefully, nobody that was at any of these gigs can sue us. Uh, you know, the statute of limitations has run out for those yard people that had put tracks in their yard. All right, so you have some advice for the beginner? Advice for the beginner? You mean like uh, just somebody who wants to be an actor or somebody who's trying to get get gigs? A lot of people that are listening to this, they're either just starting out their career, whether it be acting, singing, balloons, magic, whatever it is, they're just starting out their career, just trying to figure out where to go and what to do and all that kind of thing. You know, I think here's the thing. I think if you're an an actor or let's just say entertainer, the first thing I think you got to really think about, and this is something that a lot of new people have to really keep in mind is what is your reason for doing this? If your reason for doing this is because you love to do it, then that's a different thing than doing it because you want to make a living and and want to make money. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to make money, then you have to start running it like a business. Uh, and this is actually something that my dad told me a long time ago. And it's always, I thought, very good analogy. It's like going into a cave. If you want to be a painter and you paint on the inside of the wall, the great, this great, great cave painting, you are now an artist. Congratulations, you made it. If you want people to pay to come into the cave to see the painting, now you're a business. Mm. 
you have to differentiate yourself and know which one you are. Obviously, every artist is a little bit of both, but you can't have this concept that you're entitled to make a living if you, if you don't really buckle down and say, if I'm going to get gigs, I need to run it like a business. I need to have sales. I need to have brochures. I need to be making sales calls. I need to be on search engine optimization. I got to do all the things that a business would need if they're selling widgets. I have to do if I want to sell my magic act or if I want to sell my, you know, juggling act or stilt walking or whatever it might be. Yeah. You have to think like a business. And if you don't, you're just going to go through a lot of painful, painful, painful lessons uh, that are going to waste your time. You need to focus 99% of your energy on getting a gig, 1% of your, of your energy on performing. And it's absolutely true uh, to make a living in this business. You know, once you have your shows put together, you know, the business portion is way more important. And, and you know, it doesn't have to be a drag either. I mean, like me, um, I, I love talking about theater. I love talking about comedy. I love talking about jokes. I love talking about what we do. So, yeah. you know, every time I call a client, I'm like, hey, what a great opportunity to tell, uh, you know, somebody about what I do. Yeah. God knows my wife is sick of hearing it. You know, my mom don't want to hear it, you know. So my kids are sick of hearing it. But listen, this guy's never heard it. I get to say it again. Here you go. Here you go. Right. So, you know, it, it shouldn't be looked at as a chore. It should be looked at as a great opportunity to infect others with your enthusiasm and make them love what you do as much as you do. All right. How about some advice for the working pro? Do you have any advice for a working pro, somebody who's been doing it for a while? Yeah. Give up and get a real job. That's what oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, the working pro, I, I, you know, one of the biggest things I think the errors that we made in the past, and I, and I see this time and time again, is to understand that entertainment is not the same as selling other things. Like, let me give you an example. I've seen people do advertising without the concept of understanding of how advertising works. If you need a plumber, you know, you only need a plumber when your sink leaks. You know, you don't care about it. If you see an, a bullboard about a plumber, you ignore it. If you hear it on the radio, you don't care. If somebody gives you a card for a plumber, mm -hmm. you probably throw it away. You don't care. You only care when your sink is leaking. Unfortunately, it's the same way with entertainment. You don't need a DJ unless you have a party. You don't need a juggler unless you have a kid's part, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is. So doing any advertising that's brand awareness or a banner ad or uh, anything like that is a complete and total waste of money. Radio, waste of money. Reason why is because they'll ignore it. They don't need it at that moment. You should be focusing, if you're an entertainer and you're trying to get gigs, focus all your energy on search. If you don't yeah. do that, you're doing that at your own peril. Perfect. Well, I'm going to ask for a recommended book and then I'm, I'm going to let you go. Clyde, I've taken enough of your time. Oh, well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be on here with you. And if everybody, if anybody wants to hear about the deep metaphysical, very, very almost occult leaning secrets that lie behind the Riddles Brew Theater Company, I would advise you to get not our medium brochure, not our small brochure, but the greatest brochure in the world, <gasps> which we have written. Yes, you can get it. If you can go to our website and go to riddlesbrew.com slash book, you can go right there. You can buy it. You can also buy it on Amazon. It's actually in its second edition. So you can get the newest one with a lot more cool pictures in it. If you don't like to read and you don't like big words, you look at that. <laughs> Other than that, you'd have a great time. It's very cool, very fun, all lies, but uh, it's, it's very good information. <laughs> and tell us the name of that again. The greatest brochure in the world. How could you forget that? Do -do -do -do. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Clyde, for doing my show. This was this was really really fun. Oh, thanks, John. You got a great you got a great uh, podcast there. It's fun listening to your stuff. Oh, thanks so much. Now, if someone wants to get a hold of you or your company, hire your company, wh where where do they go? Riddlesbrew.com. You can find all the shows on there, all the different shows we're doing. If you want to come see a show, if you want to hire us to do a show, you can see all. Uh, or you can just give us a call. Phone number's at the bottom of the page. Uh, we're not going to make you go through a submit form. We give you our number. You can give us a call. You can speak to me, Clyde, right on the phone. I'll, I'll tell you everything you need to know. The man, the myth. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, and thanks to all of our uh, My Variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend. Say, listen to this podcast. That's how we can spread the word. You can reach me at my Facebook page. Uh, just shoot me out a message. And while you're on there, join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist, where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. 
That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.